So what I want you to do at this session is uh, cover something similar, um, is cover the topics in uh, the same area, but we do the help of more advanced tools of simulation. And for those of you, those who might be interested, some of the tools that I'm using, they are uh, free tools. Uh, Stellarium, it's a uh, free, um, both in the sense of freedom and beer, or it's a free in the sense you can use it without paying for it. And it's also openly licensed. It's a free open source uh, planetarium software. The only downside of this is um, you do need to install it on a computer. Um, they do have a web version and there's a mobile version, but neither of them are equivalent to the desktop version that I'll be using. So if you want to use this yourself, you'll just have to install it on your computer to use it. And, um, and for now, I want you to, uh, with my shared screen, I want you to just uh, uh, run the, uh, the planetarium simulation and, um, and give an overview of the universe or kind of um, 10, 20, 30 minute overview of what you will be seeing uh, throughout this semester. So let me launch that um, uh, planetarium software. Oh, for once I'm up to date on the version. Um, <laughs> I only launch this when I'm teaching this class and often there has been version updates since last I used it. So, um, when this launches, uh, by default, it simulates the view of the sky as it would appear at current time. Let me try to lock in this menu item so that they don't keep disappearing. So you see down at the bottom, this is you know today at 6, 18 PM. <laughs> I think a UTC stands for universal time. Well, it, it's a, um, this is a, the time zone is centered around uh, Greenwich uh, in, in England. So we are seven hours behind that. Um, so right now you don't really see a lot in this simulation because um, <laughs> you know, it's still daytime. So if you're simulating what the sky looks like right now, you have the sun out in the Western part of the sky and that's it. It's not very interesting. Now, one of the advantages of planetarium is that it's a simulation for the, the simulation for our night sky. And one of the advantages of simulation is that we could control the parameters. So if we are doing a real observation, then we would have to, oops, I paused it. Uh, we would have to, wait until the sun sets to actually begin to see the stars. With the simulation, I don't have to do that. I can just uh, advance the time more quickly, make the sun set, and observe the night sky that way. Oops, uh, too fast. OK, so this is um, at around 11 PM, about uh, five hours later. So, so this would be our uh, night sky if we were meeting up at 11 p.m. and looking at the sky. And I do have to tell you that um, real planetarium is more impressive. If you've been to one, you know it's a the, it's a whole dome shaped thing, and it's an immersive experience. And what you are seeing on this, uh, well, for me, very tiny screen. I have a 13 inch screen and. Even if you had a 20 inch um, bigger screen, it's the experience here is necessarily not quite the same thing as, no, it's not definitely the same as what you'd experience under the real night sky. And it's also not, um, this is a simulation of a simulation. It's a simulation of a planetarium. So it's not even exactly the same as the uh, planetarium experience, but, so, so that's the downside of simulation, but the one of the ways it's useful is, I think with a little bit of imagination, you can still imagine what should be seeing either in the planetarium, which is the simulation of the real sky, 
or in the real sky. It's just that you have to use a little bit of imagination. And I turn these cardinal point labels on to kind of help us um, have that sense. Because you know, if you're just standing out in the open field, then either through looking at the map and compass, you would uh, kind of have an intuitive feel for where the southern direction is, where the northern direction is. That's something that you would uh, take some time to orient yourself and you would have some feel for where things are. Uh, but you know, in this simulation, it's hard to have that feel. So I have these cardinal points labeled so that it uh, helps you with your imagination. And I'm pretty sure those lights are simulation of a distant town. Those are not actually starlight. Looking at this night sky, um, it takes a bit of effort to put yourself in the shoes of um, ancient shepherd. Someone, uh, let me make it a little bit easier by turning off some of the labels. Where are my labels? Um, can I not turn off the star labels? Um, I'll just leave them on. I mean, that labels a little bit in the way, but we'll just let it be. <laughs> it, so it takes a little bit of imagination, effort. Uh, imagine you are just standing out in the um, field at night, you are looking at the stars. Um, and I think this is probably a fairly realistic simulation of the night sky in the cities, as in it's really hard to see very faint stars. So, oh, wait, I guess, <laughs> I, okay, I, I see what they're simulating. Yeah, so when these are in my field of view, they are simulating the stars as they would appear near the cities. Near the cities, we have a lot of light pollution. The, uh, the dimmer starlight has to compete with the artificial sources of light. And um, you really only see the brightest of the stars. But now let me just uh, turn away from the city light and you get to see uh, more of the fainter stars. And if you haven't done this before, I would do, uh, really encourage you to try this out over the next few days. See if you can locate, um, locate the Big Dipper, one of the best known asterisms in the northern part of the sky. Now, you do have to be careful uh, in that um, you have to look for it at the right time. And I remember looking for the Big Dipper in the northern part of the sky in one of the semesters earlier, and it took me a very long time to find it. Um, and let me zoom out a little bit and see if, uh, ah, okay, I think I see it. And again, this is a simulation of a simulation. So the big deeper that you see here, um, it's not quite the same experience as actually locating it in the sky. I remember still when I first learned to recognize the big deeper in the night sky, I think I was in middle school or high school then. Um, for me, the one of the first things I noticed was just how big it is. Because when you're seeing this in a picture or on a computer screen, that doesn't really give you the good sense of really how big uh, the constellations actually appear. Uh, how do I? Okay. Oh. <laughs> right now, it's a little bit hard to control this because um, I'm zoomed out so far out that this has a fisheye lens thing happening. So this is big deeper. Um, it's, uh, one of the best known asterisms because it's uh, really seven relatively bright stars in a pattern that um, once you learn to recognize it, it's quite recognizable. <laughs> so a lot of different cultures around the world have come up with different stories. So within the Western tradition, this Big Dipper, Big Dipper is part of the, um, the Ursa Major constellation. Uh, let me, so this is the Ursa Major, constellation <laughs> with the constellation art, this looks like this. Um, so there's a whole story attached to that within the, um, the Western tradition and other cultures have their own. Because I think uh, one of the things that um, uh, I find it to be nicer about asterisms than constellations is constellations are sometimes very arbitrary, like, you know, so when I turn on this constellation lines, like I don't see those lines when I look at the night sky. It's uh, 
it does not look like a bear to me. <laughs> it, so, you know, constellations can be very arbitrary, but um, a lot of asterisms are, have some distinctive shape. So it's uh, um, a lot of different cultures saw a bucket. That's why it's called the Big Dipper. Um, and so once you learn to recognize the Big Dipper, it's uh, useful because it can be used to locate the North Star. So the, that experience is a little bit ruined here because this is after it's already labeled the polar is for you. But if you look at the light sky where you don't see these labels, the way um, people, the way I learned to locate the North Star is by first finding the Big Dipper. It's easier because it's a more recognizable shape then you take these last two stars in the Big Dipper in the far edge of the, the you know, wall of the cup. And you kind of imagine putting a line through them. And you go out a distance of about, I think it's seven times this separation. One, two, three, four, five, or five times, five, six, some, you know, somewhere between five to seven times the distance. And North Star or Polaris, it's one of the brighter stars within this region. It's not the brightest star. So if you're just uh, looking for it without any aid, it's hard to <laughs> find it. Um, but with the aid of these two stars in the big deeper asterism, you can locate the North Star. And uh, the other constellation that I learned to find that uh, for some reason harder within the software is uh, Cassiopeia. It looks like a W that's on the opposite side of the Big Dipper. Um, I think it's this one. That's Cassiopeia, I think. Uh, constellation label. Yeah, Cassiopeia. It, um, it's a kind of a set of uh, bright ish stars that are in W looking shape and um, being able to locate Cassiopeia sometimes it helps because the big deeper where we are in the on Earth, it's not up in the sky um, all the time. Let me just advance the time a little bit to show. Um, oh, I guess. Well, let me see here. Um, I think. Let's see. Will the big deeper set sometime? Ah, uh, wait. Okay, um, so it's uh, so in the summer it's easier to speak the big deeper summer the time we are in right now. I'm going to cheat a little bit using the fact that we are using a simulation and turn off the atmosphere. Um, the reason the sky is bright during the day is because the sunlight, the light from the sun, is scattering from the atmosphere. So if you turn off the atmosphere, if you imagine Earth had no atmosphere, then even during the day, the sky will look um, look dark, so that you can still see the um, you can still see the you you can still see the stars even during the day. And just to, and, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, please uh, go ahead. You said that the um, the Big Dipper is more visible in the summer. So for like countries, I guess, on the other side of the equator where summer is our winter, is it more easy for them to see summer like in these months? Or is so, it easier for them to see it when it's their summertime? <laughs> so on the other side of the equator, there's a whole different problem. There are parts of the globe where people can't see the Big Dipper at all. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Let me address that in about five minutes. I think uh, okay. that's a very good point. I will address it in about five minutes. Okay. Um, so um, in the Northern Hemisphere, and I think this applies to more or less everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere around our latitude, you know, 30 degrees north, 40 degrees north. Um, so, so Big Dipper is easier to see in the summer because it's out in the sky at night in the summer. So, um, so, when, so right now Big Dipper is up here and it's going to, after some period of time, it's gonna dip below the, uh, below the horizon. Ah, there it is. So it's dipping below the horizon enough that it will be hard to see. And for us at this time of the year, it's, uh, uh, so that happens in the day. So by the time the Big Dipper is setting, you wouldn't be seeing them anyway. Let me uh, show you in our 
in our part of the earth, what it looks like in the uh, winter. So I'm just going to, uh, again, use the fact that I'm <laughs> using a simulation and advance the time to the future. Let's say, um, let's say this is uh, our winter intercession and we are in December. Then um, this is what the sky looks like. And let me just advance the time until when I can find the Big Dipper. Oh wait, uh, Big Dipper is already up there. Oh yeah, so now if I turn the atmosphere back on, um, oh wait, maybe it's can not that bad. a quick question, sorry. Yeah. Um, what's the significance of Cassiopeia again? It's, uh, um, it's uh, the constellation on the other side of uh, Polaris from Big Dipper. So, so it, there isn't really much of a significance unless you follow the Greek mythology or whatever. But um, let me show, um, let me illustrate this. Let's see here. Mm. So right now we are kind of in the more hours of the morning. Let me just turn the time back to evening. Um, so sometime around 6 p.m. Oops, went too far. 5 p.m. 6 p.m. Okay, so so let's say you are. This is winter. We are in December, and we are out um, in an open field, ready to observe the sky. And let's say you are trying to do what I was describing earlier, and you are looking for Big Dipper. And um, this is where you wouldn't find it because the Big Dipper hasn't risen yet. So let me advance the time a little bit and uh, point out when, so, okay, when the Big Dipper is beginning to rise. Uh, I guess when the stars are moving, you can see that this is North Star without the Big Dipper. Ah, there's the Big Dipper. So the Big Dipper will have risen around the 9 p.m. So that's when you can begin to recognize it. Um, so, but you know, if you are out there before 9 p.m., then the Big Dipper would still be below the horizon and you wouldn't be able to see it. And locating Cassiopeia, it's uh, useful if you are still trying to find the North Star without the aid of Big Dipper. Then, because it's on the opposite side, you can almost uh, guarantee that if you don't see the Big Dipper, if you can somehow learn to recognize this M or W shape, then um, then finding this will help you kind of locate North Star relative to that. But beyond that, there isn't really a significance. So, um, so I guess even in winter, um, for a good chunk of the night, the, the Big Dipper is, oh, oh, because yeah, we, in winter, the night is longer. Uh, so um, yeah, it's a, I think for most of the, Ah, uh, yeah, um, yeah, so 